Okay, my name is Dr. Geraldine Kay, and I'm pleased to be sponsoring this event, and I'm here to talk to you today about global careers and actuarial finance. Uh, I am an actuary myself, so I've suffered through all the studying and the pain, but oh boy, is it worth it. It is such a wonderful feeling when you do finally qualify. Um, and the quicker that you can get through, the better, because then you can start really living. Um, I'm joined today by some of my colleagues, by Colette, sitting at the back, who has worked <coughs> for 10 years as an HR manager in South Africa. Natalie, sitting next to her, who has worked for a search firm in Belgium for three years. And Jason, who is obviously still stuck in the traffic, um, who is our consultant responsible for Asia, um, with a view to returning there in the near future to head up GAPS Hong Kong. Actuarial skills travel well. The actuarial qualification is one of the most mobile of qualifications because at least nine of the, or it might be ten, uh, of the exams are the same in every country, or at least are completely transferable uh, or to an equivalent exam. At one time, they were trying to make the complete fellowship of the actuarial qualification transferable. That didn't work, but certainly at least um, halfway through, the exams are transferable. But um, Jenny, who is um, Trevor's colleague, will, if she can't give you the exact answers of what the transferable exams are, will be able to find out for you. And they are trying to make even more exams transferable. There are no other professions that have as large a proportion of their exams transferable. There are mutual recognition agreements with all of those countries that I've, rec that I've um, set down. Once you have qualified, there are bilateral agreements for the mutual recognition of qualifications with the institutes of India, South Africa, Canada, the US, Australia, and Japan. So you can see, you can move around pretty pretty well. There's also a mutual, multilateral mutual recognition agreement covering all mutual associations of the group consultative of the EU, which is the organization of organizations that Trevor was talking about. The actuarial profession is also the first to have a, a single global qualification. And this is the CIRA Chartered Risk Enterprise Actuary. And the subject matter for this, uh, I can't see Tony, Tony Hewitt? No, he's, oh, he hasn't sat through the talks. But he's the professor here that introduced it at Imperial. And Imperial includes that qualification within the actuarial finance uh, program here at Imperial. Now, the biggest problem with international recruitment, which is what I've been asked to talk about, is that of obtaining work permits. The UK, along with almost every other country in the world, have tightened up on their immigration policies. In this country, Many companies have apparently become reluctant in employing foreign nationals, even if they have a valid work permit. I really do not want to comment on the legality of that statement, because I'm not a qualified lawyer. I understand a part of their reasoning, because they, if they need an employee to travel for the company, they may need to obtain a Schengen visa, and this can be time consuming, and they do not want the additional hassle involved. 
regardless of the legality, um, because one can understand their reasoning, this doesn't mean that I justify their reasoning, and I don't think that it is a justifiable reason. But it might help to explain to you why sometimes you get the reactions you do. However, there are many countries in the world which are very welcoming of qualified actuaries with the right experience. For example, although South Africa and Malaysia produce many actuaries of their own, there seems to be a desire of many of those actuaries to travel, and therefore they are always looking for actuaries who want to come to those countries. There is also a tendency for employers to require business fluency in the language of the country, especially for client-facing roles. However, ever, there are also many clients who turn around and say that they don't require the local language, especially the Swiss and the French. In reality, I always suggest that you have at least a smattering of the local language because you need to know what is being said. Be what is being said behind your back and also how to buy an ice cream mm. when you go shopping. And believe me, it is nice to be able to go and buy an ice cream on your own without having to have an interpreter. Many candidates ask me which language they should learn. All I can say is choose something you enjoy because it is very much a matter of fashion and by the time you've learnt the language, the fashion is likely to have changed. The other thing is if you get a facility with languages, it then becomes much easier to learn yet another language. It is also very important to read up on cultural differences in the workplace between your home country and where you will be working. I'm sure most of you have seen the HSBC adverts on either the television or in the airports and you can see uh, the, the differences and the mix-ups that can happen if you don't understand the local culture. Now, although I've been talking to you about foreign languages, it's even more important if you intend to migrate to the USA. You might think you are speaking the same language, but sometimes the same words can have very different meanings and could result in a tricky situation. And you can see, pants and pants. Okay. <laughs> um, International CVs. A CV is a culture, have culturally based formats, and the style and the information that it includes differs from place to place. In the UK, a CV is typically two pages long. In South Africa, it can be as long as ten pages. But in Israel, no more than one. The writing style can also vary. For example, in Holland, it's typical to refer to your experience in the third person. He did this and he did that. Oh, sorry, or she did this or she did that. It mustn't be sexist in, in CVs. Okay. A major difference is the nature of the personal information that you're expected to provide. In the UK, US and elsewhere, it's considered to be unprofessional to include information about your age and marital status. And it is also illegal for the potential employer to ask about them or indeed any other personal information that might be grounds for discrimination. Elsewhere in the world, such information is actually expected of you. And if you don't provide it on your CV, then you are likely to be asked about it uh, and to be asked why you haven't included it at an interview. There is, how, 
however, um, a format for an international CV, it should be clear, concise, and up to date. Always use reverse chronological order because with your most recent experience first. And as it says on the slide, include contact information, qualifications, summary, professional background, education, and personal information. Always you include any accomplishments, honours, languages, skills, and anything else that can be beneficial to your employment. Ultimately, relocation is a very personal decision, and no matter how carefully the move is planned, there will always be surprises. To avoid the unpleasant kind, we advise our candidates to take a holiday in the country they are considering preferably combined with face-to-face -face interviews. This serves a two-fold purpose. It demonstrates commitment to potential employers, as well as helping the candidate come to the right decision, so that they can fulfill their dream without <coughs> it turning into a nightmare. So I hope that has helped you with some idea of international recruitment. It may be a few years down the line before you're looking at it. That's the other thing. It is much easier to move internationally once you're qualified because the employers then don't have to worry about you having study leave and time off. And another thing, although it doesn't come into international, my personal advice to you is to get rid of the exams as quickly as possible. You must be committed to qualify as an actuary. People do not fail because they can't pass the exams if they have got as far as you have. The only reason for failing the exams is giving up because there is more to life than studying. But if you can get your exams out of the way quickly, that shouldn't be a problem. It really is worth investing your time and energy in studying and qualifying quickly. It was the advice that was given to me and I just I won't tell you how many years ago, but I'll pass it on to you now. Okay, thank you.